It's great to see you here. This is what a full house looks like now, <laughs> which is amazing. <laughs> Couldn't ask for more. Uh, I'm Cynthia, the festival director, and yeah, I just want to welcome you all, first and foremost. And I want to welcome David Alasuga and Clive Miri, who will be having a conversation here with you. Uh, but before that, uh, I, want to, I want to invite you all to discover the program in the festival to, through the website, through the newspaper that you can find around. Um, you will find a myriad of films, of artworks, and you will find the retrospective that is called Films Belong to Those Who Need Them, Fragments from the Black British uh, Film History. And this retrospective was programmed by a, um, a group of people who are actually those, not those, some of those who need these films, and some of those who are still making films and um, working for so many stories to, to come out and to be, to be known and shared by everyone, because it is a collective history. History is always collective. Um, and so it's, prog it's been programmed by filmmakers, by programmers, and one of the programmers was David Alasuga. So thank you so much for contributing. So welcome, David and Clive. I invite you to go on stage, and I invite you all to um, not just hear, but engage. Uh, unfortunately, we are going through a pandemic, and therefore, not only we are asked to, if possible, when possible, keep our masks, but also to ask questions through your phones. So you have slido.com and then you have a code and you can uh, type your questions and Clive will see the questions uh, and will be able to relay them and to engage with them, okay? Thank you very much. And thank you very much, David, Clive, I want to say one thing. I, I, sorry, I'm an immigrant here and a very recent one. I, I come from Portugal and I arrived in uh, late 2019. And David's book, Black and British, was the first book I read when I was trying to understand British society from a deeper perspective. So thank you, David, because it taught me a lot. Thank you, everyone. Have a good session. Cynthia, thank you very much indeed for that. Hello to everyone here uh, in Sheffield, in the hall, and uh, to all those who are tuning in online as well. Um, thank you for joining us for this In Conversation with the author, academic, and documentarian, David Olusoga. Now, David is, of course, one of our most preeminent historians and has been working in the television industry for more than 20 years. I know he doesn't look it, but uh, more than 20 years. He's a producer and runs a production company, Uplands TV. He is, of course, a familiar face on screen, having presented programs and series such as A House Through Time, the BAFTA award-winning Britain's Forgotten Slave Owners, and Civilization. In addition to his television work, he's also an author, and his books include Black and British, A Forgotten History, Civilizations, Encounters, and the Cult of Progress, and The Kaiser's Holocaust, Germany's Forgotten Genocide, and the Colonial Roots of Nazism. We're going to get to discuss um, elements of all those uh, books coming up. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, we're going to discuss David's career in full, look at some clips from some of the programs that he's made as well that have been important throughout his time in front and behind the camera. And we're going to get a sneak preview of an upcoming program as well. And as Cynthia said, we'd love to hear what you've all uh, been thinking about uh, in relation to our conversation over the next hour or so. So please do get in touch. Slido app is up there. Um, just log on to that and you've got an access code there as well. Anyway, David, it's good to see you in the flesh at last. I know we've uh, we've communicated on Zoom uh, last year, um, but I'm just wondering how has lockdown been for you? Because I know you've, you've met your brother outside for the first time since September, I think. That's right, yeah, yeah. I'm very careful when I talk about my experience of lockdown because mm. um, 
the first few weeks were wonderful because I think when you're too busy, what you dream of is that the world's going to stop and you can catch mm -hmm. up with all the things you're behind. And then suddenly mm -hmm. that happened. But then what, what happened a few weeks into lockdown is um, the murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I need to be careful is I don't want to imply that I'm the victim of the mm -hmm. murder of George Floyd and everything mm -hmm. that followed. But what it suddenly meant was that the things that I'd been writing about and making programs about for 20 years were suddenly everything that people wanted to discuss. And then 12 days after the murder of George Floyd, the statue of Edward Colston, the 17th century slave trader, was toppled in Bristol, the city I live in. So it, it was, in some ways, kind of the busiest time I've, I've, I've ever known, um, because for sort of terrible and wonderful reasons. Terrible reasons because of the catalyst for that moment that we're, I think, still living through. And wonderful because I don't think there's ever been engagement, I've never witnessed engagement mm -hmm. with these issues about race, racism, empire slavery um in the past and so it's been a remarkable um 12 14 15 months that's really interesting because you know there's been lots of discussion about the fact that the pandemic has laid bare the fissures in society the divisions uh given uh voice to some of those people who've been marginalized um and as a result that i suppose has focused attention on your work because that's essentially what you've been doing for years it's been uh, really bizarre. I mean, programs that I made 10 years ago, five years yeah. ago, have suddenly been rebroadcast. Um, books that have been on the shelf for quite a long time suddenly have been reprinted and people wanted to um, to read them. And I think what, what happened, particularly in Britain, but not exclusively in Britain, is that because the pandemic laid bare, as you say, the, the depths of racial and other forms of inequality in Britain, mm -hmm. and because the horrors of what happened to George Floyd made people acutely aware of the workings of racism, that it auto almost automatically became about history. Because mm. those issues about contemporary racism were born out of a history that we, I argue, as a country, had not properly processed. And so very quickly, this issue about contemporary racism also became about history. I mean, the two of the biggest names in the news cycle last year were Edward Colston, who literally died 300 years ago in mm. October 1721, and then Winston Churchill, who's been dead you know, um, for 60 years. So history, these unprocessed histories of race and empire, just exploded into people's consciousness. There were weeks in the summer last year when the majority of the books in the bestseller list were to do with race and black history. So if those of us who've been banging on about these sort of things for a long time, it, was, uh, it has been a remarkable period. Okay, so there's there's a relevance there to the work that you've been doing, but you studied history at Liverpool. Yeah. Take that relevance away, or maybe that is the point of, of, of your life and work in the sort of historical field. What is your fascination with the past? Well, I, I got into history because I was obsessed with the Second World War, as all the boys in my school were. So I got mm. into it for the worst boys' own reasons of being Same here. fixated. Yeah. Mm. And then my white British mother told me something which really shocked me one day. She said that Nigerians, I'm half Nigerian, I was born in Lagos, there were Nigerians in that war. And in Lagos, the city you were born in, there's a memorial, a monument to the Africans who fought in the Second World War. And I almost couldn't believe her. Mm -hmm. And the example I use is that I, uh, shows my age, we had lots of plastic toy soldiers, me and all my friends, and we loved them and were obsessed about them. Mm -hmm. And my favorite were the um, British Eighth Army the desert rats who yeah, fought them. Yeah. And the picture on the front of that box of soldiers was of a group of white soldiers. Mm -hmm. And then when I studied history, I realized that was one of the most diverse armies ever created. It was full of people from India. There were Africans, there were people from the West Indies, people from Cyprus. Mm -hmm. So this, once I'd become interested in history, I then began, began to realize that there were missing links. That there were omissions that were glaring and I think wrong and dangerous. And I think once you work out that there's a sort of hidden code to something, um, I think if you're, you have the right sort of mind and the right sort of interest, I became obsessed with those forms of history that we weren't talking about. Mm. And that really is what my career has been about. It's been about the, here's the stories that we don't tell. Mm. Past truths that we can all learn from now, I, I, I suppose. I mean, is that why you entered broadcasting then? To take that knowledge to a wider audience, take it away from the lecture theater and lecture hall and to a much broader base? I think, to be honest, I ran away from academia. I mean, I, 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 mm. what I didn't want to end up was uh, a middle-aged history professor in a suit. So it was about the worst ever escape attempt. Um, no, there's anything wrong with that. If you're a, 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 a attempt to escape. Just wasn't for Dave. 
and that's exactly what I've ended up. Um, so it was a terrible attempt to yeah. escape from a fate. But um, mm. I wanted to run away from academia and go to television because the place that I'd loved history was on television. It was mm. the documentaries of Michael Wood in particular. Okay. Um, so history on history was kind of always TV history for me because that was where history came alive. I loved reading about history, and I had a wonderful history teacher at school. But really, it was history on TV, and I wanted to make TV history, and I knew I needed to find a route um, to take me into television. And I imagined, and I was right, it would be a long and um, circuitous route, because I just dreamed of making the programs that I'd watched when I was younger. Mm. What, what was it about Michael Wood's work that, that, that attracted you? I mean, he, he is, he's a, a historian who made um, groundbreaking programs on the history of Britain, the UK. Um, and, uh, you know, from way, way pre-1066, I think, you know, Saxon Times and so on. Um, what is it about his work that fascinated you? Well, in terms of the, arena, the arenas of history in which um, we work, I mean, there's almost no overlap. I mean, mm. um, and Michael's, exactly. uh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm very much a modern historian. Michael, Michael made history on television um, dynamic, mm -hmm. urgent, and kind of cool in a way mm. that no one ever had before. I think when you, when you think about what, how history presenting evolved, it evolved from the university lecture. And the first you know, master of it was A.J.P. Taylor, mm. who was really taking the university history lecture and bringing it to television. And I think uh, history programming and history presenting has never quite shaken off its roots of being linked and having come out of the university lecture. But I think one of the people who was critical in making it more about travel and dynamism mm. and urgency and about the moment, uh, about trying to transplant you back into the moment when decisions were making were, were being made and things could go either way, I think Michael was absolutely pivotal in transforming how history was presented on television. And as I said, he made it, he made it cool. Yeah, he yeah. traveled everywhere. Yeah. He went up in helicopters. Yeah. As a teenage boy, that was, you know, it wasn't just interesting. It was it being in a story, yeah, it looked great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but you, you did a course in broadcast journalism. That's right. Uh, so, and not sort of general production as such. So did you have ideas of becoming a journalist, a, a reporter? I didn't. I, um, that mm. was that was that was just a routine. That was the that was if you didn't have money or connections. Right. That was then, and I think to a certain extent now still seen mm. as one of the pathways into working in television. I mean, I worked out very quickly. I didn't want to work in a local newsroom mm. um, in the UK. Mm. It seemed like a very anti-intellectual environment. But there was mm. lots and lots of useful skills to be to be right. garnered. But to be quite honest, I think I've learned more about journalism from you know, writing for newspapers for the past 10 years than I have in that, in that course. It was practical, it was useful. Really, it was because it was, I didn't have any other pathway. Right, right. So a general course and then the postgrad journalism course, it, would you recommend that to, to, to someone trying to get into television? Well, I mean, the, the, the great problem that, um, that I faced and I think is faced by young people much more now is that the more courses you do, the greater your debt. Mm. So my early career, and I don't think we ever talk enough about this in television. People want to talk about their, 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 their latter years and their successes. I don't think we talk about the economic predicament that people mm. from working class backgrounds face in their early years of career. And my early career is not dominated by grand plans or ambitions. It was dominated by debt. And that was the debt from an education because I, I, you know, I had to pay for it myself and I had to take out loans. So it wasn't the best route. Uh, it wasn't something that I think you can advise without realizing that we're in a country where, where now people pay for every second of their education. And that, that is a barrier um, to millions of people. Mm. So what was your first job in television? Uh, my first paid job was, um, was actually a tiny bit of calculation on my part. It was at Radio 4. It was a broadcast assistant at Radio 4. Mm. And what I worked out early on was that if you had no contacts and no money, but you had lots of ideas, radio was a better place to be than yeah. television yeah. because you need loads of ideas. Because as a producer in radio, you need to make 10, 12 programs a year. You don't make one a year or two a year. Mm. So as a place where if your currency was, you can generate you know, a lot of ideas very quickly, radio was a brilliant place to be. Uh, and it was a place where I could move fast because mm. I could sell lots of ideas. And we sort of got to the point where I was selling more ideas than the producer who I was the assistant of. Mm. So it became ridiculous and I moved really quickly. I was a producer within two years um, of joining the BBC. Um, and I'd worked previously in television and of course my, my journalism degree was in television and radio. So um, I was able to move between the two media. 
Okay. So uh, you got in behind the camera, as it were, lots of ideas, and you started making programs. Um, do you prefer being in front of the camera or behind? Um, the thing I like most of all in TV is devising is development, right. devising okay. programs. So that that's the thing that I think is the most interesting, the most creative, mm -hmm. um, in some ways the most intellectual part of TV because it's problem solving. Mm -hmm. It's taking the, the the demands of this very demanding medium and then taking these these stories from the real world and trying to bring them together, inventing formats, finding ways, finding the right presenter, the right approach, the right device. Sounds um, very academic. It's it's so creative, inventing, yeah. and, and I, I, I think development is, I, I'm not quite sure what the appeal of television is if you don't want to devise want to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's glamorous and interesting, and there used to be travel. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I, Develop, developing programs, coming up with ideas, coming mm. up with format. That's where the kind of the alchemy of television is. Mm. Mm. No, I to totally agree. Well, we're going to show some clips from David's programs now. Um, some of the sort of major programs that have helped define his career. You talk about development. What is it that attracts you to a story? What is it that gets you excited, gets you going? Uh, it's the same thing that was when I, when I began as a teenager to work out that my history books weren't telling me stuff. It's about telling stories that people don't know about. It's about saying, here is the other piece of the jigsaw that you didn't learn at school, that isn't, isn't um, in the history books that we normally read. Here is, here is the omissions. And that is, remains just the most exciting thing about history. And the combination of history and television um, what is it about television that lends itself to explaining all that stuff that you're interested in? I'm not sure. I've, I've, I've thought about that. And I'm not quite sure what it is and what I saw in television early on. I mean, I love books. I admire the best history writers. I write history books myself. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't want to sort of say history on TV is something that uh, is, is, is above history on the page. But to me, it was magical and powerful in a way that even even the best books, mm -hmm. the best books aren't. I was, there's documentaries I remember watching as a teenager and being absolutely just captivated by them. One of my great joys of joining the BBC uh, in, in my late 20s was I could go to the archive mm -hmm. and I could re-watch documentaries I hadn't seen since I was 16. Mm -hmm. And that was just fantastically you know, enriching to see them again. And I think there is something about television and, and history stories, mm. that's really yeah. what it is. Yeah. And I think television is one of the greatest mediums that any, anyone's ever created, even though its, it's death is constantly being predicted. Mm -hmm. It keeps surviving, it keeps adapting, because it's an incredible magical medium. And I think when you, when you couple the power of that medium with the significance of those historical stories, I think there's something, you know, alchemic happens. Sure. All right, okay. Well, we're going to see a clip now from your film, Namibia Genocide and the Second Reich, a film that was shown on BBC4 in 2004. Just tell us a little bit to introduce the clip. Well, this is in some ways the kind of archetype story of something that we didn't know. And it's, it's recently been in the press, so many more people do know about it, which is between 1904 and 1908, Germany mm. carried out a genocide in what was then German Southwest Africa. And it transported people to concentration camps in cattle trucks. It, justified the genocide in the name of Lebensraum, the idea of the German needed living space, which is an idea that the Nazis adopted. Um, and people within those camps were, were subjected to medical experiments and their bodies were handed over to racial science. Now that all sounds horribly familiar. Mm -hmm. But when this happened, Hitler was a teenage boy in Austria. It's a fundamentally critical event about which most people knew nothing in 2004. Um, many people still don't know uh, now because it's only last month that Germany acknowledged that what happened there in Namibia was a genocide. Mm -hmm. So it is an incredibly important story that is almost invisible. Mm. And in fact, there are lots of people who didn't know that Germany had a colony in yeah. Namibia in West Africa. So let's just see that clip. Over there. Powerful opening to the film there. I mean, I, I personally love the fact, um, and it was one of the first things you made as a producer, I like the fact that you chose Samuel West as the voiceover, because that is a voice that people would recognize as um, the narrator for powerful documentaries on the Holocaust, um, on Hiroshima, on, on 
big historical narratives and you're basically putting this on the same pedestal, which must have been really important. Yeah, and that was exactly the idea. And I think one of the, the tendencies has been to see African history as disconnected yeah. from world history, a specialist subject, a marginal subject, and for it to be treated not with the same level of seriousness. And I also think there's a sort of danger that we've, as program makers, we've, we've felt that, that the, the emotional value of stories justifies changes or, or, or lapses in production standards and, uh, or, or, or journalism. Let me give you an example. I made a series about the First World War um, and the, the role of non-white soldiers and, and auxiliaries in the First World War. And my rule was that we, we chose the most dynamic, the best stories, not the stories that were closest to home. Mm. So one of the stories that is not central to that is a story that I think has been, is part of black British history and part of black British sort of historical and iconography, which is the British West Indies Regiment. Mm -hmm but it's just not as important a story as others. And I got lots of criticism for that. Yeah. Now, I wrote a book to go with a series in which I lavished attention on the British West Indies Regiment, but that journalistic, difficult journalistic choice, mm -hmm. what is the most important story? And it you know, came down to the choice of, do we talk about this one regiment, which is quite small, or do we talk about the possibly a million Africans being swept up into the war, in, largely involuntarily, and their remains being uncommemorated by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. The choice to me is we have to be journalistic, and that means difficult choices. Mm -hmm. And I think very often in programming uh, that was to do with with, with non-white communities, there was a sort of sense that those those rules didn't apply. And I think mm -hmm. we made programs that was less effective mm -hmm. for that reason. So it's really difficult, but I want to make programs that are really dynamic, that have the same production values as any other subject. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, how do you go about making that kind of film then, as a, as a producer? Well, I feel when I watch that now, I, I, I see a film full of problems. I also see my own self shooting because we mm -hmm. had very little money um, right. to make that film. I mean, that film, it's funny, I, I wrote to um, Rhoda Keating last week, who was mm -hmm. the commissioner who commissioned that film after the after Germany, the German um, ac apology and acknowledgement of genocide, because people I know in Namibia had said that that film and the book that me and my co-author wrote were sort of part of the discussion that had led to that moment. I just want Rowley really to know that this little film he commissioned for BBC Four people in Namibia were still talking about at this important moment. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that film came about because I slightly sort of was obsessive. Um, I got a grant to go to Namibia and started filming it myself. And I told my bosses I was going to make it anyway. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think people thought, well, either he's gone mad or he's onto something. Mm -hmm. um, and it was sort of commissioned sort of out of a, well, okay, you know, if, if, you, oh, if you're absolutely sure. Here's 20 um, pounds. So I, I, I sort of look at that film. It was made very, very cheaply. Um, yeah. um, and it was a real struggle, a real struggle to make. Um, um, but I kind of think I was right, mm -hmm. because now, 20 years later, mm -hmm. the significance of this history is now better understood, partly yeah. because of this film, books, mm -hmm. my books and other books, um, because it is important. And it mm -hmm. was important back when I was begging people to take it seriously. Yeah, yeah. Well, talk about forgotten histories. The next clip is from your 2015 film, uh, Black and British Are Forgotten History. Uh, why did you want to show this clip today? Because, I, I, I mean, I love this clip because it's about the, the contributor, Isa Two Smith. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, to me, I mean, I think a lot about presenting. And being a producer who also presents and still being a producer who also produces means I give a, I give a lot, probably too much time to thinking about the, the formal um, and technical aspects of how you present history. And... Mm -hmm. This to me is one of those moments when it worked really well, where I could occupy a certain position and I could allow somebody else to occupy a very different position. And I think the result is much more powerful because she's empowered to say what she says. Mm -hmm. And I'm empowered through the producing and the planning of this yeah. to take the position I take. Absolutely. Okay, let's see the clip. It's such a powerful moment when you come across the, the, the rape house. And I wonder how important it is for you to be a human being in those moments and not be the dispassionate, you know, um, historian who's bringing this truth to the public. You're just being yourself. I mean, everything that I try to do in presenting is about creating those differences of tonality, that you can be a different person, you can allow a different facet of who you are to be 
at the surface of any one moment. But I mean, there's, there's, that could all have been done as pieces to camera. I've read the academic papers that Isaac has read, but mm. there's a num multiple things. There's one is, it is much more powerful to hear those details yeah. from a Sierra Leonean woman than it is for me to give a piece to camera. Mm. It's much, much more powerful, much, much more, I think, truthful in significance. And I think that the, the other thing is that it, because I present, I produce myself when I'm presenting. And my kind of view is that the, I produce, we, we work together as producers to, before we're filming, but on location, I'm producing me. They're directing the film, I'm producing mm. me. And that was all about, that was all planned. Every question that feels like it was a stumbling journey towards mm. meaning, everything is planned mm. because it's about enabling her to say things. And it's about me trying to think, well, what did I feel when I read the academic paper? about that structure and try to feel that again. Um, and it's, you know, it sounds a bit sort of like mystic, like sort of method presenting, but mm. if you don't, I mean, why fly to Freetown and take mm. a boat up a river in the middle of the summer when it's hot and uncomfortable and there's other insects and why do it if you don't care? Mm. So uh, the idea of making that series and not caring about it is mm. just palpably Sure. Kind of ludicrous. So that if that doesn't, if I can't bring that across, then it, it's it would be so ineffectual. Yeah. So lots of sort of thinking about who's speaking, what role is the presenter playing at that moment, mm -hmm. and what role in relation to the audience. Mm -hmm. My job there is to is to 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 feel something, mm -hmm. not to say something. Yeah. yeah. But it's also important as well, isn't it? I, I'm assuming to have someone like Issa to tell. A section of the story because she is someone with great expertise and experience and knowledge and and she brings that extra level of credibility to to the whole project as well yeah and i think we haven't thought enough about who tells and who yeah. speaks yeah, yeah. and whose stories are valid um and caring about that is not just thinking that my voice is important it's about thinking that my voice is a way of bringing other voices um to the screen and other experiences i mean this that's a really important place in British yeah. history. Yeah. It's never been filmed before. Yeah. It's critically important. I don't think we can understand ourselves as a nation without places like that being part of our story. Mm -hmm. And we need to, to be guided through them for people 3,000 miles away in Africa for whom it's a shared history. Mm -hmm. And I said it's critically important in that. Yeah. I mean, I might as well bring a question here from Steve. He's got in touch. David. How do you retain your warm, calm manner when talking about and interrogating what can be extremely challenging topics? Because I'm consciously and very purposefully aware that there's a trope waiting for me of the yeah. angry black guy. Yeah. Yeah. And if I fall into that, it's a ready-made trap. It's a, it's a ready-made trope. It is there. And people are so comfortable putting black people into those baskets that I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of where the landmines are. Mm. Um, and also people don't listen when you're angry. People don't listen when they're being shouted at. I think people can, can listen and can engage and can see this as a shared history rather than a history uh, attacking them if it's presented in that way. So I'm very kind of um, purposeful about it. Mm. It's interesting. Well, in this next clip, uh, we see you in front of the camera but as we've discussed, you've done a lot of work behind it uh, and you have your own production company. What are the different pressures producing compared to writing and presenting? Um, I don't think I've ever been very good at separating the, the two. And I think when I, on location I'm presenting, but in the preparation of filming, I, I, I can't not be a producer. Mm. Uh, and I have to co-produce things because you can't unlearn those skills and you can't not think in those terms. So I think there's a sort of element of producing in everything that I do. Um, but when you're on location, presenting is hard enough. And as I said, I'm trying to produce my performance. Um, then the demarcations seem really, really easy. Um, but they, they kind of, they flow into to one another and they, they, they have to be part of the same, the same process. I think, I mean, you never retire as a producer. You can't unlearn their skills. I'm afraid this is for life. Mm. Once you start analyzing programs and think about them and how, how they're built and how they're made, you cannot undo that. When I was at, um, at studying journalism, I think the, the wisest thing was, was said by a TV lecturer. And he said, go home this weekend, watch television, because I'm going to ruin it for you. 
mm. because you'll never be able to see it in a mm. dispassionate, non-analytical mm. way again. Mm. And that was entirely true. And, and I, I can't sit down and watch TV without thinking, why have they done that? Why haven't they done that? Well, that's an interesting device. Must remember about that technique. Um, mm. So I, I, I'm, I'm always, always producing. So how does that fit into writing books as well? Because you tend to do that for each series that you, that you make. Uh, which comes first, actually? Um, it's been different in different cases. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's been after, sometimes it's been during. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they're very, very different. They're, they're, they're profoundly different. I mean, TV has to be, uh, and wonderfully, TV is collaborative and it has to mm -hmm. be. And it's about multiple talents. Books are necessarily solitary. Even when you're writing a book with somebody else, it's, mm -hmm. it's quite a solitary process. So I kind of think a combination of the two is great. Um, you know, it, when you finish the book, Getting out and making a TV program with the crew and a team feels wonderful. Mm -hmm. After a lot of TV, sort of sitting down for mm -hmm. six months and writing a book feels really, you know, wonderfully sort of self, you know, centering and uh, and um, uh, an individual pursuit. Um, but they're, they're they're sort of they are kind of parallel careers. And I was writing books before I started presenting, so mm -hmm. it, it was producing and writing, um, and I. I'm very, very interested in the art of writing books and mm. technically how it's done and all of my favorite writers. It's not just because the subjects they write, um, it's the way they write. The they and it, I'm, yeah. I'm constantly writing notes in books and must remember that clever device. Mm. And uh, I mean, when I wrote my first book, um, I took the book I most admired, which was King Leopold's Ghost by Adam, mm -hmm. Adam yeah. Hochschild. Yeah. I bought two copies mm -hmm. um, right. and um, cut it out and put it on covering the walls mm. of my house and then analyze the structure of the book by sort of on my step ladder wow. to see how we'd done it. Um, because there is an, an art to writing books just yeah. as there is to television. And yeah. Um, yeah. I see they're, they're kind of separate parallel careers and I'm just mm. sort of, you know, I feel very, very lucky to be able mm. to do two things, mm -hmm. um, you know, to a reasonably high standard. Yeah, that, that is a, a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, but they're complementary as well, I would have thought, because, you know, you've got, I don't know, six hours in a six-part series on television, and you've got hundreds of pages potentially in a book. Does it solve your conscience that the stuff that you left out of the TV program, you can whack in the book? Well, I mean, there's a slightly slight sort of less generous way of thinking about it, is when you make a, when you're a TV series, some of your ideas don't make it, and some of your colleagues' ideas are better. Mm. Um, a book is a great way of having the last word. Yeah, um, yeah. And so all of the things that you, you lost, uh, yeah. you can put back into the book. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm afraid, I'm sure there's a slightly petty, I'm not giving up on this story element oh, of it. That's uh, so cheap. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this next clip is uh, from one of your most successful television series. Absolutely brilliant. A House Through Time, uh, which has just won another award, Best Specialist Factual Programme at the Broadcast Awards. What are we going to see here? Uh, this is a scene I, I, I love because, again, it's about being able to occupy a certain space because uh, the rather brilliant producers who made this had cast it well. And so uh, it's about uh, spiritualism and mm -hmm. I'm allowed to be um, the sort of cynic. Um, and we have these two wonderful historians who are able to sort of deliver the detail that the audience needs. And I sort of, I think it's a great um, moment of kind of breaking the rules of history, uh, of, of struggling to... Uh, empathize with our ancestors and how different they are from us. All right, okay, let's see this clip. Oh, it's a wonder, wonderful clip. Um, the, the series, as I say, it's been a, a critical and, uh, and public success uh, and all focused on places that you've lived in, Leeds, Liverpool, Newcastle and Manchester, uh, uh, Bristol, sorry. Um, why? Well, that's been chance, actually. The first series was Liverpool before I was going to be the presenter of it. Uh, oh. It was also wasn't known that I did a master's degree in urban history. So it was ah, slightly okay. by chance. Yeah. Uh, then we did Newcastle because I just thought Newcastle, I sort of pleaded for Newcastle. Mm -hmm. um, then we did Bristol because my daughter was starting at school and I needed to be there that summer. Right. Uh, and Leeds again, which is where we're, we're filming at the moment. Uh, again, I think people didn't know that I lived there when it was the city that we chose, mm -hmm. chose to go to. So, but I am running out of cities. I was, uh, I think, I think I was going to say, what's Unless next? we do House to Time in Lagos, um, <laughs> which is, would be a bit of a, a, a dog leg in the series, in the series project journey. Uh, I think it, it, won't be, it won't be a city. But it's quite think. fortuitous, isn't it? Because it, it is bringing a, a regional perspective to these sort of stories, which is, which is quite interesting. You're not focusing on parts of London, yeah. Spitalfields or, or whatever. Um, 
And that's actually quite important in, in bringing the texture of history as, an, as, a, as, a, as a national um, pastime, as it were, yeah. um, to people. You know, it isn't just about London. I mean, it's, it's really important to me. And I mean, the other form of history that I've always been fascinated in is social working class history, the history right. of my mother's ancestors mm. who were very poor, who lived in Scotland and the northeast of England. Um, and what I really love about uh, Housley Time is that they are they kind of love letters to Britain's mm. provincial cities that have been forgotten, that I think rightly feel that they've been marginalised. Um, and I think we, we, we make them look beautiful and we tell their histories through you know individual houses and I, I I'm I think the last place we do is London uh, and I, I, I think it's really important um, I don't I don't live in London I've lived in London on and off because mm. it's hard to get to a TV career without living in London but mm. I'm from the Northeast mm. um, I went to university in the Northwest I now live in the Southwest um, and I, I really I get really annoyed by the London um, the London bias I mean every week someone phones me up and says, could you come in the studio and discuss mm. this? And I say, I don't live in London. Mm. And they go, ah, well, it's not compulsory last time I checked to live in <laughs> London. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm really proud of the kind of regional, the sort of flag, flag bearing that House of Time does um, for, for, for the nations and regions. And I think we should, there should be more programs. And, you know, my company, Uplands, you know, we're, we're largely based in Bristol. We'll soon be entirely based, almost entirely based in Bristol. Mm -hmm. We have to have a presence in London because you can't get away without it, but that shouldn't be the case. Yeah. So we're a Bristol company and I'm mm -hmm. from the north and it, there is life outside London. Mm -hmm. Well, as a proud Lancastrian from the right side of the Pennines, by the way, uh, I think that's wonderful. Um, okay, the next clip is from your 2019 film, The Unwanted, The Secret Windrush Files. What are we going to see here? Well, this this is about um, I think the key piece of immigration legislation. That this this film came about because what I wanted to show, and it was pitched before the Windrush scandal, oh. I wanted to show that there is a history to the immigration laws that we that we um, that we're struggling with at the moment. And those the, the key period is between 1948 and 1973. Mm -hmm. And what happened with the Windrush scandal is that that long, complicated history of immigration laws created accidentally traps into which people from Caribbean and other Commonwealth um, countries accidentally fell into. It was never intended, but that is what happened. And it, what's really interesting is the lessons learned review that Wendy Williams conducted into the how the scandal came about. What it, what it concluded was one of the reasons that the Home Office was able to act this, act this way towards Commonwealth migrants is that people in the Home Office didn't understand the history. Mm. They didn't know where the people came from. They didn't understand the legislative history of immigration laws from 48 to 73. Um, we don't know these stories and we don't understand how our nation became the nation it became. And I think they're critically important. Um, and this is about the 1962 Immigration Act, which is one of the most important and is an absolute racial law. And we like to co convince ourselves in Britain that America passes racial legislation, not Britain. Mm. Well, I don't think the 62 Immigration Act um, allow us just to stay in that view of ourselves. Mm. All right, let's see that. Please. That is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Given what we've just seen, what did you think of the government's Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, the Sewell report, that essentially said institutional racism doesn't exist anymore? Well, I think the last piece of news about that is that um, Tony Sewell himself seems to be joining the discrediting of the Sewell report, um, saying that he did encounter evidence of, uh, um, of structural uh, inequality. Um, I don't think it was a report. I think it was a play within a culture war. Uh, most reports take 18 months to a year. This was eight months. The way it was delivered, um, the, the fact that some of the commissioners hadn't seen other chapters, they hadn't read the introduction. It's been discredited by um, every field of, ac of academia. You could imagine the British Medical Journey Journal ripped apart the, the, the medical chapter. Um, there's almost nothing left of the tatters of that report other than to ask, why was it commissioned? There's one aspect of that report which is really valid, which is the recommendations. And most of the recommendations were found in previous reports. We didn't need another report. We needed to implement the recommendations of previous reports, like the Lamy report. So there's almost sort of nothing left of the tatters of that report uh, to, to rake over, um, other than to question the motivations of why it was commissioned. Yeah. And as you say, we're in the middle of a culture war. 
Um, well, the final clip we're going to show is from Statue Wars. Uh, and that's a film that uh, you produced with Uplands, your production company. It's going to air on BBC Two on the 10th of June. I should say before we show it to anyone watching that there is uh, racial language both seen and heard here that uh, you might find uh, absolutely appalling. Um, what was the intention behind this film? Uh, the film um, came about because um, what took place in Bristol a year mm -hmm. ago was we're a Bristol company, I live in Bristol, um, and we suddenly worked out that we were, we were the story uh, and that we knew everybody in the city and that mm -hmm. we had contacts and we could get the access. Um, and we thought, we need to see what's happening. Well, what, does, what does it mean if you're a civic leader when the culture wars come to town? Bristol was suddenly the center of the world. In the days after the toppling of Colston, I did, I think it was about 60 interviews. I did interviews for TV stations I'd never heard of, um, from you know, countries I've never been to. Um, and I think actually once we were making the film, we realized it was more significant than we realized because at the center of it is Marvin Rees, who's the mayor of, of Bristol, who's half white working class and half um, um, from the Caribbean. And he is a sort of mixed race British person for whom these culture war fake divisions, they run right through him. He's, 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 he's in the middle of this. Mm -hmm. It's his city, he's a Bristolian. Um, and I, I'm not sure that if this is the case, but I can't think of another film that is an intimate portrait of a black British political leader. So it became a much more important film um, mm -hmm. as we started making it. It was produced by a guy called Francis Welch, who's a brilliant Bristol filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Again, local crew, local, local producer made in, made in Bristol. But this sequence I think is really important because, because we haven't made films about what it is like to be a public figure, a political figure and black in Britain. Mm -hmm. People don't know what it is like. And this scene is a scene that is part of Marvin's life as it is for David Lammy or any other um, black politician, it's going through his mailbag. Sure. All right. Let's see the clip. As you were saying, David, you know, we, we don't see um, uh, big political programs um, looking at the lives of black politicians, um, because partly because there aren't that many. Um, so this will be an insight and, and a window for a lot of people that I think will be shocking. I think what will shock loads of people um, is that, you know, Marvin's like any other mayor. Mm. He's trying to keep a city together through um, tumultuous times. I think people who see things in these kind of simple binaries think a black mayor only thinks about black stuff. Well, Marvin's trying to keep, keep the, you know, the streets yeah. clean yeah. and he's trying to keep the schools open. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think in some ways I, I hope this film is a little bit of an antidote to the kind of culture war narrative that we have at the moment mm. because it's about Sort of professional doing his job in very, very um, difficult times. But I'm, I'm very pleased that we were, we're showing that scene because I mean, I know, I know that you've received mail yeah. not dissimilar mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we talk about this anymore. And as, you know, as, as, as the clip said, there is this idea that everything's got better and you know, we are sort mm -hmm. of um, you know, post-racial society. Well, uh, you know, I think TV's job is to reflect a mirror onto society. Um, and I don't think we've done that well enough when it comes to these issues. Mm, interesting. All right. Um, this is from Anonymous, um, which is an interesting question. Given your role as a trustee at the UK charity English Heritage, what do you think about their blue plaque scheme and the level of diversity of those plaques? Well, I'm no longer a trustee at English Heritage. Mm -hmm. um, my, my view on the, on the, the plaque is when I was um, uh, uh, a trustee, we were uh, running a steering group to try to improve that. And since then, uh, for the past few years, the number of uh, diverse uh, people, historical figures who've been celebrated has enormously increased. I was very, had a very nice day with Benjamin Zeff and I outside a mm -hmm. house that Bob Marley um, had lived in. Um, there's more to be done, but there's also, I think, more to be done across the country because the, I think there's about, is it 70 heritage plaque schemes um, in the country? And the blue plaque's one of the most famous and mm. it's just London, which many people don't realize. Um, I think we all um, across the country need to do better. But one of the problems is, is that heritage plaques tend to celebrate individuals. And a lot of black history is actually not about where individuals yeah. lived. And often the houses that people live in aren't in West London and they haven't mm. survived. Mm -hmm. It's about events. It's about court cases. It's about great breakthroughs. It's about um, meeting houses. It's about arrivals and departures. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about you know, black newspapers or, 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 or moments of violence. I think we need to find better ways 
um, of using those devices, those heritage devices, to tell not just black history, but working class history, um, um, LGBTQ history. Um, we need to adapt them if we're going to allow these heritage devices to tell a broader set of stories. Mm. Um, this is from Amala and Yika regarding Germany and the Namibian genocide. Are conflicts that Britain should admit their part in, such as the Biafra War, uh, do you think this will ever happen? I think we have to, you know, I made that film about Namibia in 2003. I was there at the battlefield of Waterberg when the German, uh, Germany made its first somewhat less fulsome acknowledgement that this mm. was a genocide. And now, 20 years later, we have this, we've got some progress. And I think we're, we're seeing that. We are, we are seeing slowly um, countries, France, Belgium, the UK, moving forward on these issues. But there's a long, long way to go. Because what happened is we convinced ourselves that these histories didn't matter and that they weren't relevant. And of course, there's also Operation Legacy in Britain, which is that huge amount millions of files of the records of Britain's colonial history were destroyed yeah. uh, or many of them are in Hanslow Park um, in the middle of the English countryside redacted or uh, or locked away. So we don't know this history well enough. So for the campaigns to actually to confront this history, we think there's a job of learning it to be done first. Mm. This is from Amy M. Um, interesting question. How do you think then we can improve the way history is taught in UK schools? I think we shouldn't rely on schools to teach history. Um, um, I'm sorry to say that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not a slight against history teachers. I meet wonderful history teachers all the time. But I think we need to do more ourselves if we want to change the way history has been taught. I, last year, um, I wrote a, a children's book, which was not something I'd ever imagined that I would do. But I did it because I was absolutely sort of pushed into doing it. Mm -hmm. My parents who kept saying, you need to write. You've written a very nice book on black history, but it's 600 pages long and I can't give it to my nine-year-old. So I can write a children's one. I have a, another children's book coming out this year. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, the onus is on people who care about this to make the materials available uh, to make the teaching uh, aids available and not really at the moment to fixate on the curriculum. I'd love the curriculum to change, but I don't think in England anyway it's going to. Hmm. Um, this one is from Anonymous. Um, BLM, Black Lives Matter, seems very linked to US history. Do you think the UK is led by America when it comes to this? I don't think that's the case, actually. I think Black Lives Matter is universal. I mean, there were people, mm. um, Indigenous Australians, who yeah. took Black Lives Matter and saw it as a, uh, a moment in which to talk about the injustices that, that they've faced. Um, I think there's elements like, you know, defund the police. We haven't had the militarization of the police in the UK. I think we need to fund the police in the UK rather than, than, than defund them, mm. um, where I think there is American specificity. But in some ways, it, it, I think it's a misreading of history. Um, Black British people have always looked to African Americans for inspiration. I mean, I live in Bristol, and the Bristol, there was the bus boycott of the early 60s, inspired by Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama. Martin Luther King came to Newcastle yeah. um, in the 60s, was given an honorary degree, and he came to the same city that Frederick Douglass had lived in in the 1840s. Mm -hmm. These histories are really close and really conjoined, um, and there's a danger in this country, and we saw this a lot this time last year, where what happened when black people said, we feel inspired by Black Lives Matter. We want to talk about black British people who've died at the hands of the police. They were told, well, racism is an American problem. And that was right across Europe, not just Britain. That doesn't work. It doesn't work anymore. It's not true. We know the statistics. We have our own problem. It's distinct from America's in any, any way, and in many ways, but we do have a problem with race. And just saying, oh, it's an American thing, I'm just doesn't wash anymore. Mm. Uh, final question, I think, uh, from David. Are you worried the current political landscape will hinder the development of such quality documentaries um, as you make um, before uh, with public service broadcasting? Well, I'm, 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 my life was changed by public service broadcasting. It was watching history programs in a council estate in the Northeast that made me want to become an historian. Um, I, I love the BBC. I love the, the ecosystem um, of, um, of television that we have in this country. And I think it's enormously valuable. Um, I, I, like a lot of people, I'm, wor I'm worried about the future, but I also think we're living through an incredible age of creativity in documentary. I mean, the, not just the public service broadcasters, but the, the ways in which documentaries can be commissioned and, uh, and funded around the world is, is really, I think, inspiring. So uh, I worry about the PSBs, but I also think we've, we've created something very special in this country, this, this body of people who come to gatherings like this and who absolutely believe in documentary. Mm. 
Um, final question from me. Um, I think it was Oscar Wilde who said the purpose of studying history is to change history. Do you agree with that? Um, I'm not sure history is capable of performing that function. I think the absence mm. of history makes not learning inevitable. I think all history can do is to remind people that we're part of this long, complicated story and that it's a shared story. Um, I see my job as somebody who's a, a linkage, uh, a connecting tissue between the world of academic history, which I also work in, mm. uh, and the world of television history. And I feel it as my sort of special obsession of trying to tell the parts of the past that we've traditionally brushed um, to the margins. What people do with that knowledge, um, I think, is, is kind of above the pay grade of historians. <laughs> Indeed. All right. It's been a pleasure talking to you. David Olusoga, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Paul. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Historian, are you coming on Mastermind, mate? Yes. Yeah, I, I got, I got the letter. I knew you were going to bring that up. Yeah. I was, but my, my specialist subject would be colonial genocide. I mean, this, works for me. Works for me. We'll, we'll get lots of pop questions into the general oh, knowledge. I, I just, way. I sort of, just, I fear for the BBC to audience and the sort of miserable <laughs> subjects I'll choose. No, uh, it, really. you, it's been a public invitation. I can, I cannot decline. Indeed. So I'm going to get you on with that sorted. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much indeed, and to those who uh, sent in their questions and who tuned in uh, online as well. So thank you for coming, and uh, what a great afternoon it's been. Thank you. Thank you.